Good morning. So the question I have to start off this morning, is there anyone who speaks another language? Spanish? Will you tell us something in Spanish? Me too. Um, wait, just like a sentence or what? Um, yo soy un niño. Anyone else? Uh, ni hao. Hola. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Okay. So the question I want to ask, and I'll be careful stepping through. Go ahead. <laughs> Hola, uno. Why do we have different languages? I think that, I think that because uh, because it feels like maybe for I have to say is because like maybe because like I don't because if everybody was like the same and stuff it will be very confusing because if somebody would be like a teacher then everybody would be a teacher and we need like police officers and uh, firemen firefighters and builders and all that and I believe uh, since we have different language, because uh, uh, that's why we can all be different, and I mean, um, so the Tower of Babel, like yeah. they were trying to build the tower up to the up to like the heaven, you know, and God didn't want that, so He made them all speak different languages, so it was harder <coughs> for them to know what to do. Very good. So we didn't always speak different languages and have different cultures. If you go back to the days of Noah when the flood came, everything was wiped out and his children began to descend and multiply and others. And we all had one language. And it starts in Genesis chapter 11 and says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed east, they found a place in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, let us make bricks and break them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, I'll get to that say. So they'd learned how to make bricks and how to make buildings. We're just learning how to put them together. And they were in unity and they were doing things together and they were accomplishing the entire earth. But then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So they were doing everything they should and multiplying and going out through the earth but suddenly they changed and they said, let's build this for ourselves. Let's build this for our purpose. And it seems kind of strange to me and to most people that a people thought they could build a tower to heaven. That seems pretty strange and unusual that you think you can put a bunch of bricks together and they not fall over uh, as you reach the heavens. But interestingly, I want you to look at what God said about that. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they will begin to do. Now nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. God said that when we're in one mind and one accord, there is nothing that people can't do, including building this tower to heaven, which was their purpose. So therefore, he said, come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad 
from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So the question is, how many of you as parents watch the news? Have you seen any of the news this week and others? Do you ever see people arguing on the news? They sound like they're yelling at you, telling you everything's going, and they have all kinds of different opinions and others. Do you think we're a unified people? Or are we a people that all have their own opinions and all purposes and others? Well, the question I want to say is, when you argue and when you do those, you place yourself where you can't accomplish what God wants you to do. When you argue with your brothers and sisters, you argue with your family, your mom and you don't get along on something, that's preventing your family from fulfilling their purpose. Now, did y'all under, when I had people give little speeches, little sentences in foreign languages, did you understand any of them? There are hundreds of languages all across. But God gives us the ability to come together as we do in this house in one mind and one accord. And when that happens, there's nothing we can't accomplish. They were in one accord, but they had chosen to use that for their own purposes. God had said in the beginning with Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they wanted to stay in one place altogether. So sometimes we're unified in things we don't need to do. And it's when we're unified in God's purpose that he can bless it. So we're going to sing. How many of people know he's got the whole world in his hands? So we're going to sing that. So he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the mamas and the papas. In his hands, he's got the mamas and the papas. In his hands, he's got the mamas and the papas. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the little children. In his hands, he's got the little children. In his hands he's got the little children. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to just invite uh, Pastor Chuck and Miss Libby if you want to come up or if you want to wait. And I know the Lord's bound to put something on your heart before it's over. <laughs> Let's give them a big hand applause right here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, for those of you who think you saw me wearing a sports court coat earlier, vain imaginations, all it was. I figured if I could pull my coat off and pull my shirt tail out anywhere, it's here. Uh, I was about to have a nuclear meltdown while, during worship, and you say, well, do you sweat like that? I can preach in a meat locker and sweat. That's just... <laughs> You can imagine when I used to go to the mission fields down in Haiti and it would be 120 degrees when I got, I lost a lot of weight. <laughs> That's all I can say. And it was all water. But it's been a while since we've been here as far as to preach. I think I looked at my phone at the calendar and I, I think it was end of July, last time we was here. We've had a few things happen since then. Some of you know the details, some of you don't. If you don't, you don't need to know them. If you do, just keep praying. It's all good. But we, uh, we, we look so forward. I know we slipped in a while, a few weeks ago just for service, and uh, we always enjoy being with you guys. We do. But how many can look at me this morning and agree that we're living in a different time? And you say, are you worried about it? Uh-uh. Why? Because he got the whole world in his hands. We've got it all figured out. Now, 
I'm going to share some things with you this morning. I'm not preached anywhere else. Uh, it wasn't that I was saving uh, just to come here, but uh, Pastor Mike and uh, Teresa, we had lunch this week, and he said, can you preach Sunday? I can preach anytime if the day's open, I can preach. But we, when we began to just consider what God was saying, actually it was that morning, I think we met on, was it Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday? But on Thursday morning, that morning I had been working on some things in my office at home, uh, just actually preparing the radio program. I don't know if I don't know, we even had the radio program last time we were here. Uh, we have a radio program now, it's on an inter internet-based uh, station called Plateau Community Radio. It's based out of Canada, and we're on there on Wednesday mornings at eight o'clock. And you say, you know, why did you do that? Because the Lord actually prompted two pastors to step up and make way for this to happen. And right now we're running between 1.1 and 1.2 million listeners each week. I preach more in one week than I have in, to people as far as numbers than I have in my entire life each Wednesday morning. And sometimes that's just Wednesday morning numbers, and sometimes they rerun it on Wednesday nights, and they, I don't know how many is listening then, but we're, we're all over the world. Our feedback we get is from uh, Hong Kong, South America, several countries down there, uh, Japan, different places. The Lord has opened this door. So we're taking advantage of that. Now, I didn't mean to linger there very long, but like I said, if I could take and line you up in a line and pray over each one of you this morning, you know what I'd pray for? You say, well, I need healing or I need this or I need that. I would pray for your life that there would be great, great clarity and there would be renewed focus. Now, if you've not been aware, uh, uh, Brother Ralph asked if anybody watched the news. Uh, I'm very careful about watching news because it makes me mad and I don't want to throw my shoe through the TV screen so I just don't watch a whole lot of news. But if you have, and you've heard all the things going on, this actually started back in 2017, 2018, and everything began to get turned upside down. But did you notice suddenly there was a lot of people speaking prophetic words that didn't come to pass? That went over real big. You don't have to turn to this scripture. If, you want to, if you're going to follow me in scripture, go to Jeremiah chapter 23, and I'll meet you there in a moment. In Luke chapter 9, verse number 57 and verse, through verse number 62 says this. Now it happens as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, that phrase there is, is fit is very, very important because when you read that scripture, a lot of people think, well, that means if you look back, then you can't go to heaven. That's not what it means. The phrase there, it's fit, means you're no longer well placed. You cannot look back at where you've been and still reach where God's trying to take you. And we have a tendency in our lives to look at life and say, okay, I wish I could go back. I wish we would do it that way. No, looking back means that you get out of position. Now why? When you're running a plow, uh, I was around the farm as a kid. My friend uh, Ken sitting there, he was raised on a dairy farm. Pray for him, it still affects him to this day because all he did was work seven days a week. But on a farm, we didn't have a tractor, we had a team of horses. And those horses would pull the plow, and my uncle would be behind that plow, and he had to keep his eye on where he was going, a mark out in front of him. If he didn't, the rows went like this. And God is looking for some people in this hour who can look at where he's taking them and not get distracted by looking back over their shoulders saying, I wish we could go back. You say, but it was good back there. It's better out there. You say, but I, I conquered the problems back behind me. Yeah, but you'll conquer those in front of you. You sang the song this morning. We're fighting a battle that he's already won. Yes. The church has got to awaken to some things. Now, listen to this. In Amos chapter 11, don't have to turn to this one either. Amos, 11 and, uh, eight, Amos 8 and verse number 11 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, when you don't hear God's word, he said, there's coming a time, I believe we're in that time right now, where we're not, he's not that God's not speaking, we're not hearing. Some people have ears to hear, but they don't hear. 
He says that what happens when you get not hearing from God, they wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the Lord, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. You say, well, you're not very encouraging this morning. Hang on, it gets better. We've got a lot of people who have turned a deaf ear to anything that does not please them. Now, if it's a word they like, oh, they'll try to run with that. But what I began to understand uh, at the, at, when we were coming up on the last election and then the COVID thing hit, I heard all these people prophesying and suddenly I said, they're not coming to pass. And guess what? Very few of those who prophesied words that didn't come to pass ever repented of saying those things. They just act like it didn't happen. Now we have to go to Jeremiah chapter 23. I have, and verse number 25 says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesies lies in my name saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Now when you look at this in, in the Hebrew, the word dream there is the lowest realm of prophecy. That's the beginning stages. So they're saying I've dreamed, I've dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesies lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is, now here's, I'll come back to this in a moment. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is it not my word like a fire, says the Lord? And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says, behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. Now, I have got you really discouraged now, haven't I? Because so many people have gotten so wrapped up in prophetic words. But you, say, but you, but you might say, but Chuck, you've spoken prophetic words over some of us. I have. But let me tell you right now, I don't do that casually. I've had people try to get us to come in and you know, we were in a restaurant one day and there was a couple there from, uh, that they're not in Asheville, they're from another city and we happened to walk by their table and they got our attention. They said, we're gonna talk to our pastor and see if you, we can get you to come and prophesy over the people and Libby sing in tongues. We're not a dog and pony show. If I ain't got it, I don't give it. You say, well, I need a word today. You better talk to God first because I ain't giving it to you unless he gives it to me first because you don't need to hear what I say. That went over real big. But see, we have gotten so addicted to prophetic words. Can I just be honest with you? I get, I don't know how many emails every day from people giving prophetic words. And guess what? Some are prophetic and some are pathetic. Oh. But we have become so addicted we don't want to hear from God for ourselves. We want somebody else to tell us what God's saying. Moses had to do that at Mount Sinai, but the Holy Ghost lives in you now, and you don't have to have somebody come and give you a prophetic word. Now, I'm glad when they do. Nothing wrong with that. Can I just, I'm home, so I'll just, I'll just be real. You know, we were in a service a few weeks ago on Wednesday night at the church where we attend when we're not preaching, and services ended, and they just dismissed everybody, and Libby and I are gathering our stuff up, and we start to walk out, one of the elders comes up to us and says, this is what the Lord will have me to say to you. He didn't try to broadcast it. He just dropped a word in our life. He said, this is what I hear. Now, am I still, am I just running with that word? No, I'm still chewing on it. Don't just jump up. Now, get this. Every prophetic word that we get, get this, it has to flow through an earthen vessels. And earthen vessels can be wrong. Even partly wrong. Ain't nobody smiling at me now. Because some of you may have packed your bags on one prophetic word, and you've got to be careful with doing that. Why? Because, now, I'm not saying that everyone who missed it are prophesying lies. I'm just saying that a lot of people did prophesy lies. And when we become dependent, now get this, this is what happens when we depend totally on prophetic words, on false words anyway. 
the prophet here is having to deal with these false prophets, Jeremiah is, and they're using false words for their own benefit. Here it is. False words breaks the heart of true prophets. The land suffers. Now, this is what was contained in what we just read. The land suffers due to the false words that are being released. The false prophets will be driven into darkness. They will be fed wormwood and gall. False words make the people worthless. God will release a whirlwind against them. God did not send them, and yet they ran on their own strength. I told you I hadn't preached this anywhere else because if I knew if I did, they wouldn't ever let me come back. <laughs> but I've got to out around this because I'm hooked up with Pastor Mike, yeah, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> the tools of the false prophets are this. They prophesize lies. What does that mean? They prophesy deception, disappointment, falsehoods, and they're false and self-deceived. It says the deceit of their own heart means deception and tricks. They forget my name, which are false words, steal the truth concerning who God really is. They have dreams. I said this earlier. That's the lowest grade of prophecy. And who steal my words. Now get this. They take the words of a truth prophet and manipulate it for their own means. Have I got you discouraged enough yet? <laughs> You've got to understand this. Why? Because I believe that just like we had a few years ago, there's going to be an upsurge in so-called prophetic words. And churches will be led astray if they are not grounded in what God is really saying. I love you guys too much to let it get by without having the opportunity to say this. There's a lot of flaky stuff going on in the body of Christ right now. And because of that, there are a lot of churches that are on the brink of total collapse. They don't know which way to turn. They don't know what to do. I had, I had coffee with a pastor this past week, and you say, well, he must be in Asheville. That's none of your business. But he, he, he is at a breaking point where if something doesn't shift, he's not going to make it much longer. Another pastor friend of mine has a building that is about half again as big as this. It's, it's, it's bigger than this building. And he is just looking for somebody to take over paying the light bills and he'll let them use that building for free. Why? Because his congregation has withered away to just a handful of people. A church, I, I, was, talk, I was talking to my neighbor recently and he is a retired uh, minister. I almost said what denomination, but he, came, he come riding up on his lawnmower the other day. Libby heard him coming. He said, I think, I almost said his name, didn't I? I think so-and-so's coming. Well, I did. I, I said, that's him. He's come, to, he come to see me. So we sat down outside. He's getting ready to turn 87 years old. And he, went, he goes to a church now where, I can say he's retired, but he goes to a church that just a few years ago ran 300 people. Now it has between 15 and 20. There's something happening in the church. And if we're not careful, we'll latch on to something that is not from God in trying to appease our sense of emptiness and we will be led astray on what was behind us. And I'm not looking back anymore. How about you? I've got a history. I'm 71 years old. I can look back. I can see a long way. But nothing back there interests me anymore. Why? Because God has dropped something in the body of Christ, and I keep reaching toward that. Why? Because I've got to finish my race, and I don't have time to retrace my steps. Now, I got you real discouraged about what a false prophet does. But listen to what is encased in true prophetic words. The power of a true prophet with a true prophetic word is this. 1 Corinthians says this, 1 Corinthians 14, 29 says, let two or three people speak, let the others judge. A true prophetic word is not afraid of being judged by other people. So many people, in, true prophets, they don't care if you want to dissect the word. Why? Because they know it's from God. If you get into people with false words, they don't want you dissecting that. They'll say, well, you just got to believe it because I said it. Let me, give you a, let me give you a real spiritual term for that. Hooey. You say, well, you, you, you know, you're just being mean. No, I'm just being truthful. I don't listen to every prophetic, prophetic word because a lot of them are pathetic words. I don't listen to them. Why? Because just because their mouth opens and closes like a book, it don't mean it's a Bible. 
We are li living in an age when we've got to hear from God for ourselves. Yes, people will be used to speak into our lives, but it's got to bear witness with, with the Spirit and with His Word. It cannot just be based on something. Can, I, I know I may, may make some people mad right now, but I don't believe that Elvis is leading the choir in heaven. You say, where'd that come from? There's a prophetic word out there saying that. I go to heaven every time I want to and I get up there and Elvis is leading the choir. I hope Elvis is in heaven, but I don't think God needs him to lead the choir. Another one says that Christopher Reeves, I mean, remember Christopher Reeves, the original Superman on, in movies. He's teaching people how to fly in heaven. There are ponds full of chocolate pudding. Now you know why I don't listen to every prophetic word. True prophets will let you look at that and say, is, you know, if that's God, it's good. If it's not, we don't want them to do with it. You're not afraid to let your word be judged. Amen. Why? Because it's not your word. If it's your word, you've got to stand behind it. But if it's God's word, he'll stand behind it. Oh, yes. uh, well, Pastor Mike, it's going to be again another year before I get back here. <laughs> All right. The word judge there means to learn by discrimination and to try and to decide. It means scrutiny, which is a critical observation or examination. He says, then a true prophet will speak my word faithfully. The word faithfully there means this, to be firm, to endure, to be faithful, to be true, to stand fast, to trust and have belief and believe what you just said. We cannot be wishy-washy in this hour. There is an uptick in the spiritual realm and not just what God's doing, but what the enemy's doing to try to short circuit what God wants to do. Now you may de believe differently than I do, but I believe that we're living in the last of the last days. I believe that we're living on, uh, the, I believe that the, the clock is ticking. You say, when is he coming? I ain't got a clue. Anybody that tells you know, they know exactly when he's coming, they ain't got a clue. Why? Because Jesus said, I don't even know when I'm coming, but I'm ready for him to come. How about you? You say, but Brother Chuck, I just, I like living. So do I. But guess what we've got on the other side? Paul says, I saw things I can't even tell you about, but I'm here to tell you today, I am going to live as long and faithfully as I can. Why? Because I have a work to do. The Bible says that when I am old and gray-headed, Father, do not forsake me until I talk about your power to those yet to come in, in, your, power, in your mind to this generation. I'm old and gray-headed, but get this, I still have a word for this generation, and I'm not going to back off of it. You say, but Brother Chuck, I think, you need, I think you need to be cooler. I can't be cool. I can't be cool. I, it's just not in me. I, you know, they say, well, you need to dress a little cooler. I, you get to a certain point in life, you don't care about cool, you care about comfort. I was part of a big ministry for a long time, and when, you, when I first went to those, uh, the meetings, everybody wanted to look like a past, the pastor of that church. They had them funky shoes on and them old ragged jeans and they'd spike their hair. I can't spike my hair. I'd look like a unicorn. <laughs> Say what you will. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 18, we know the story. They have just, Peter and John had just encountered the man at the gate. They have saw him healed and raised up. And then they are brought before the tribunal, so to speak, the religious leaders of the day. And they said, you got to shut up. But they said, for we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. The, way, the reason so many people are, are speaking uh, false words is because they've not seen or heard a true word and are able to speak that. They have come up with things by their own devices. They have come up with their own ability. They have come up with this idea, well, if I say this, it will help me. I'll say more about that in a moment. But God is looking for people who are hungry for what he's saying in this hour, at this moment, at this time, and willing to walk in that, even if we don't like what he's saying. You say, Brother Chuck, has God ever told you things that you didn't want to hear? Are you talking about this morning? Yeah. He does that. That's why he gave me Libby. She keeps me straight. If I had not had her by my side, and we're coming up uh, uh, next month now, on 52 years as husband and wife. 52 years, yeah. I would have resigned the church that we were part of for 30 years, 7,365 times, if she had not talked me off the ledge. 
But see, God places people with a word in your life. It doesn't have to just be the one behind the pulpit. Do you realize that God can give you a prophetic word where you work? Oh, wait a minute. Brother Chuck, they'll think I'm crazy. Well, if you go to church, they already think you're weird. And crazy is just another short step. Huh? If you begin to look, Neil, you're in a tough place where you work. I know you're a trainer and a teacher for the most part, but you work in the prison system. There's some people there that are there for a reason. I have found out most people I used to lock up were never guilty. They say, he said, any change, same thing. But God can give Neil a prophetic word for that prison system. Why? Because his word knows no barriers. It doesn't have to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. You say, well, Brother Chuck, who, who do you think you are? It's none of your business. If my gift don't tell you who I am, then you don't need to know. You say, you don't need a title? No. I don't need a title. You say, well, I can't figure out who you are. Join the club. <laughs> All right. Next thing it says is, what is the chaff to the wheat? Now, automatically, some of you who have studied have, a, have an assigned definition for what chaff is. For the most part, we, we think of someone like Gideon who's threshing wheat behind the wine press and they would toss it up in the air and the wind would blow that chaff away, leaving the grain behind. It didn't have to be wheat. It could be corn or anything. They do it that way. But with the word chaff here takes it a little bit deeper when it says this. It's straw threshed fine. Get this. It's camel food. That's what it translates out in, in Hebrew it, or livestock food. It's a stalk of grain which has, from which the kernels have been beaten out and the straw broken up by a threshing machine. In other words, it's been through a process. It's just not what you saw at face value. When a prophetic word is released from God, understand this, it's been through the process. And then the wind of God, the Holy Spirit, can blow anything not necessary out of that word so it comes out as pure seed. We have got some chaff-covered words. It's not that they're wrong. They have tied other stuff to it. What they're saying, in essence, is basically true, but they have tied their own understanding to it to get what they want. God is looking, he's raising up prophets, I believe this in this hour, who are going to bring a pure seed. Why? Because the wind of the Spirit has blown the chaff away from them. When you guys were still on the upper street, the last time, if I remember correctly, that I preached there, before you moved down here, we're there at the end of service and we're praying and it just came up out of my spirit. I said, wind of God, blow through this place. I didn't say it. I don't even think I said it in the microphone. I just said it and suddenly, now you say the air conditioning kicked on. No. Suddenly there was a wind. And some of you came to me and said, I felt that. They wanted to know, what was that? The wind of the Holy Spirit is being refreshed in the body of Christ. Why? Get this. If you go back earlier in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 2 and verse number 13, I think it is, it says, my people... God talking to the prophet Jeremiah, he says, my people have committed two evils. The word committed there means to construct. They did it by their own strength and agenda. They have committed two evils. The word evil there means bad and disreputable, but the thing that we don't bring into that sometimes, it also means malignant. As it metastasizes inside of the carrier, it begins to eat away healthy flesh. He said they have created something that inside of them is eating away but just hasn't yet been exposed. They've, co they've committed or constructed two evils. He said, first of all, they have forsaken or abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and hewn or dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The church has been guilty of being afraid of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit's given liberty to move, it takes control out of our own hands. That went over real big. You gotta understand something. 
God has set the, the house in order. He's given apostles, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But that does not mean it's our church. It's still his church. And if he has liberty, he will do things that we cannot even imagine him doing because we cannot do that ourselves. But that scaring of the leadership of the church caused us to dissuade the Holy Spirit and say, get over there and we'll call on you when we need you. But until then, we're gonna drink out of our cisterns. But God said, I got them covered. Why? Because he said, their cisterns will not hold water. When you look at that word, the fountain of living water, it means a spring. How many of drank and have a spring up in the mountains? Mm. We used to go to the mission field. I would not drink out of just any cistern. Why? Because they were bugs in that thing. And you would get what we called Montezuma's or Duvalier's revenge. You'd go home thinking, he set me free. Do I need to go any farther? I don't think so. We would, not, we would not drink that water because it had been laying there and things had been able to grow in there that was harmful to our body. I'm here to tell you we have created cisterns out of desperations. You say, what are they? We have created music that doesn't glorify God. But it's got a catchy beat and you can dance to it. Some of you know American Bandstand. That used to be their catchphrase. Some of you are not even clue, you're clueless as to what American Bandstand was. But it, we've, we've taken worldly music, no edification of God, and we've tried to turn it into something that worships him, and it is falling flat on its face, and people are leaving thirsty. Why? Because we've never given them an opportunity to step into worship. We've created children's ministry that are nothing but babysitters, and we're not, in, we're not, we're not giving them the word of God. We're just giving them a place to go to get them out of our hair. Libby, start the car. We're going to have to make a run for it. <laughs> we have done all these programs with good intentions. But can you, can you understand if the Holy Ghost is really given opportunity, you don't have to worry about how well they sing because they're singing in his anointing and it's going to minister to whoever. Yes, I believe in good musicians. I want good singers, but I want the anointing more than I want anything else. I want children's church to be, be a place where the kids are equipped to do the work of the ministry. Oh, that's for the adults. Your kids are being programmed by a world system, and if we do not give something to outweigh that, that world system will capture their heart, and by the time we figure it out, they're already gone and grown. Oh, Jesus, help me. The Holy Spirit wants, to win, wants his wind to blow back through the church so that he again can blow the chaff, remove the unnecessary, the things that were designed for the animal to eat, not for his created beings. Oh, well. Because I know in Isaiah, I don't have, to, I don't have time to read all this because I gotta get, gotta get to another place. Isaiah 55 in verse, uh, in verse number 11 says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, which means it will not, it will not be vain and it will not have effect. If the... A true prophetic word glorifies God, but it impacts those who hear it and act on it. Let me just throw you a curve. Prophetic words are normally, true prophetic words are accompanied by if. If you do this, if my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. A prophetic word does not come to pass just because you hear it, it, becomes, it comes to pass because you act on it. Mm, well, okay. He says, my word is like a fire. The word fire there means a fire that you use specifically for consuming a sacrifice on an altar. In other words, his prophetic word burns the sacrifice and the sacrifice has to be dead before it can be offered a prophetic word helps us die not naturally in most cases but spiritually it sets us up to die to ourself and I <laughs> I'll be honest with you I love the Lord but I'm not looking forward to going to my own funeral I like living but the thing about it 
I have to die daily. Why? Because he says that it is a reasonable service to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We go to the altar to be sacrificed so that in our death we can be resurrected unto the nature and the mind of Christ and we can walk in the fullness of who God's called and created us to be. You cannot mingle your flesh and expect God to give you everything that he has for your life. You have to die. Look at somebody and say, you got to die. I don't know if I should have said that or not because some of you got real nervous right then. Because your husband looked over at you and said, you got to die. No, no, not, not that way. Not that way. He's a consuming fire, he says. I read that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 29. It says, for our God is a consuming fire. A prophetic word helps God to consume every aspect of your life. And then it says, it's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. I almost run by this without really digging into it because I, I thought I knew what the hammer was. It's talking about a rock. But the hammer, as it's defined here in the Hebrew, get this, it means a forge hammer. One like a blacksmith would use. He said it breaks the rock. In other words, the foundation of your life, that forging hammer can break up anything that you have built your life on other than the rock, the true rock, Jesus himself. You say, how do you know that? There was a parable in the Bible that talks about two men. One built a house on the sand, one built a house on the rock. Storm came, the wind blew, the waters rose up, and the one on the sand, it was destroyed, the one on the rock stood. It was not just about the foundation, but the location. Prophetic words help us align ourselves where God intends for us to be. If you're, if you're a regular part of this church, until God tells you otherwise, be here. Well, Brother Chuck, I just want to follow the leading of the Lord. Make sure it's the Lord leading. I'm not saying you, should, you can't leave a church. The hardest thing we ever done in ministry was walking away from Candler House of Prayer almost 16 years ago. Why? Because we had been there for 30. And to walk away from something that's so familiar to you is not always easy. But the hammer of the prophetic word of God will help align you. Remember, it says, looking back, all you do is get out of place. His prophetic word puts you back in where he wants you to be. Can you handle just a little bit more? Two of you said yes. That's all I need. But I think one of them was Libby. And she's got to ride home with me. Turn with me if you would, because I, I believe this is relevant and pertinent for this house right now, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. You say, Brother Chuck, I don't carry a Bible any longer. It's no longer relevant. If it ain't on your phone, you need one in your hand. You say, Brother Chuck, I just, it's just cumbersome. It's old school. Humor me. I like my Bible. Now, I got one on my phone, I'll be honest. But I've got one in my briefcase right there that when I pick it up, it just kind of wraps around your hand because I wore it out. And it's got all my notes in it. You need to spend time in the Word. And it's, I'm not saying you can't read one on, uh, you know, on a tablet or on your phone. That's fine as long as you're ingesting that Word. I hadn't planned on saying that, but I did it anyway. You need to have a regular program, a regular exposure to the Word of God. I've been doing this for... I said we almost we've been married almost 52 years and that same month that we got married a year before I got saved So I've been a believer for 53 years. I spent a lot of time preaching. I preached a lot of sermons But get this every day. I have I have a program that I use Actually, it's actually on paper. It's not even a program. I've carried that that program for almost 20 years and every day I read certain scriptures, not looking for a message, not trying to find something to preach on, but just to expose myself to the Word of God so that I can read through the Bible every year. I discipline myself with that. It's one of the last things I do at night is I sit down and read that portion of scripture so that by this time next year I've read through the entirety of the Bible. Why? I don't get it all the first time. I read things that I have read hundreds of times and I say, wow, never saw that before. That was just an extra uh, tidbit this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse number 19. The children of God are in bondage. Part of the bondage was this in verse number 19. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistine says, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, 
his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. And the charge for the sharpening was a pin for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, the axes, and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan's son. Now, wait a minute. The enemy that had them under control says, we cannot let them have anything that creates weapons of war. Now, they would let you come down and pay to sharpen your farming tools. Why farming tools? Because they got benefit from that when you got the crop in, they took their portion. A prophetic word is not concerned about who gets what as far as their portion. And I believe that God in this hour, as we're preaching about true prophetic words, are raising up a, a remnant in the church. I should say the remnant's already there, but they're being made aware that they are literally called to be blacksmiths in the kingdom. And the enemy is terrified of blacksmith because he said they kept them there and they would not. Now, understand this. How many ever watched Gunsmoke? Some of you are ashamed. <laughs> I watch Gunsmoke. I know how Chester limps. I know, I, I know how Festus looks. I try not to look like him. I know how grumpy Doc can be. I know how much whiskey Miss Kitty can drink. That is the drinkingest woman I ever saw in my life, drinking whiskey and eating boiled eggs. You say, well, what are you talking about? Watch enough gun smoke and you'll know. But a blacksmith on gun smoke, I know that um, Burt Reynolds was the one for a while, but most in these old Westerns, you see a blacksmith, he's great big guy, huge muscles, usually wearing a leather apron. He's kind of grungy looking, usually got a beard. Why? Because that's the mindset that we have of what a blacksmith is. That's not a kingdom blacksmith. Here, listen to this. In the kingdom, the word blacksmith in Hebrew means this, a skilled craftsman, a sculptor, and an inventor. I believe that God is awakening people who are skilled in the place are willing to be made skilled in the place that he's created them for. You say, you say, Chuck, God's not created me for anything. Jeremiah found out the hard way. He said, but God told him, said, for you were even formed in your mama's womb. I knew who you were and that I would cause you to be a prophet. You're sitting here this morning. Everybody do this. Can you feel your heartbeat? Everybody go. You just took a breath, you got a heartbeat. God has a purpose for your life. Libby and I, a lot of times at breakfast, we listen to David Jeremiah. You say, he's not Pentecostal, but he's a teacher of the word. And he made a statement one day that just rung my bell. He said, if you ain't dead, you ain't done. You're not dead, you're here, you've got a pulse, you can breathe. God has a purpose for your life and his prophetic word, he wants you to be skilled in that, why? He's called you to be a blacksmith in the kingdom and you have to be skilled at what you do. What we have treated church as is just something that we show up for every now and then. When it's convenient. The Lord spoke something to me months ago, he said, my people have become so convenient oriented casual or oriented that they think that's what and comfort oriented they think that's what church should be I hope I have said something this morning that makes you uncomfortable why because if what I say ain't changing you and challenging you it's probably not a word from God I'm not here to appease you some of you may be thinking I wish you weren't here at all I'll be leaving in a little while it's okay See, that's the benefit of what I do. I get to come in, I get to throw this stuff out, and Pastor Mike has to deal with it. Because <laughs> I'm going back across the hill to Asheville here in a little while. But God is looking for some people who are willing to be skilled in who God's created them to be. When we talk about the equipping of the saints, it's not just so that you can look good, it's so that you can be empowered to do the work of ministry. The word ministry for the first 35, 40 years in the, in the, in the church was not a title, but it was a job. The word minister fit everybody, not just apostles, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. 
It was so that we could take the kingdom as his ambassadors, which means the representative of a ruling authority into every facet of life and not be shy about doing it. We say, well, Brother Chuck, we had a great service. Five people got born again in the altar. Thank God for that. But how many got born again at your job? How many of your neighbors got born again? You say, well, Brother Chuck, you're being awful strict. Again, I get to leave in a minute or few. God is looking for people who will be willing to be trained so they can be skilled. It also means a sculptor. There was a famous sculptor whose name slipped my mind right now. But they said, how did you do that statue? He said, well, I looked at the block of granite and took away everything that wasn't supposed to be there. And all that was left was the statue. Prophetic words cut away the unnecessary things out of our lives. You say, Brother Chuck, I don't have any unnecessary things. Come on. I promise you, you don't have to put rocks in your pocket to be able to sit down in a bathtub. You won't go out here to the lake and just take off running and walk on water. If you do, call me. I want to see it. There's still areas of our lives that we need to work on. Hmm? My brother Chuck, in, in 50-some years, you should have figured it out by now. Pray for me because I ain't. I still mess up sometimes. I still want to talk to people that can't hear me when they cut me off in traffic. I know y'all have grown beyond that, but I, I, I don't cuss. But sometimes I want to. I'm just being facetious. Our lives are not perfected yet, and prophetic words helps take away as the sculptor, the blacksmith. Pastor Mike and the different ones of the leadership team of this church, they have an obligation to be able to take and help you get down to what God wants you to be, and that means removing some unnecessary things. Three of us are looking at me like a cow at a strange gate right now, but that's okay. And then here comes the part of the blacksmith that is an inventor. You say, Brother Chuck, I got to hear the Holy Ghost. Do you not think the Holy Ghost is a great inventor? But guess what? He moves through you. He's not walking around here loosely. He's inside of us. Do you not think that God can give up what they call witty inventions? Things that have not yet been thought of? Business opportunities? I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I was talking to Brother Ken earlier today. They just opened up a new business in Utah, selling park houses to Mormons. Oh, I don't want none of that Mormon money. Bring it to me. I told him the story. Our, our, who used to be our pastor, uh, a member of his church, won, the, won a part of the Georgia lottery. And he brought the tithe, which was $10,000 and gave it to the church. And some of the elders said, oh, pastor, we got to give that back to him. That's tainted money, don't you think? Our pastor spoke up and said, yeah, it's tainted. It taint enough. <laughs> As you look around, you see the prophet Elijah sitting by the brook Cherith. He's sitting there. He ain't got nothing to eat, but in, in, in flies a raven with bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat at night. Some theologians said that bird got that from the king's table because he's the only one who could afford meat. But get this. Elijah ate something that an unclean bird brought him. Why? He didn't eat the bird. He used what it brought. Do you not think that there are unsaved millions and billionaires out there that if we are in tune with what God's saying, that they can give us the necessary means to fulfill the purpose and plan of God? But Brother Chuck, they're not saved. Through their giving, we are believing they will get saved. I'm not going to turn anybody away. You've heard me say it before. A lot of people get all freaked out about tattoos. I don't care. You got tattoos, that's all right. Do I want one? No. I'm at the age now where gravity's took over. A butterfly on my back would turn into a buzzard on my butt. I don't want no tattoo. I said that out loud, didn't I? I don't need no more hope piercings in my body, but I don't care if you've got so many that you whistle like a tea kettle in a hard wind. I don't care. 
What's God doing inside of you? Prophetic words will take you from where you were to where God wants you to be. And the blacksmith can understand that and he has the inventive, of a, a inventive ability to take what other people discard and use it for the glory of God's kingdom. Why? He sees it for a whole different purpose. Now some people may say, next Saturday you should not be out there amongst those alien believers. I've met some people that I almost swear were aliens, but I won't get... I, I pastored some of them. <laughs> Ken's not looking at me right now. I don't care. But God has called this house to be a forge area. And get this, when you are swinging that hammer, when you're being a sculptor, when you're being a skilled tradesman, when you are the inventor, you're going to get sweaty. It's going to be dirty work sometimes, but it's going to advance the kingdom. And get this, God is looking for people who are more concerned about the kingdom than they are about their comfort. Well, Brother Chuck, if we bring those kind of people in here, what's going to happen? The heavens are going to rejoice because there's joy in heaven anytime somebody gets saved. But Brother Chuck, they'll bring crazy people with them. Good. I, I have found out crazy people are going to come to church anyway. We might as well get, get them saved when they show up. Don't you look at anybody right now. But there's one more verse, one more verse in this scripture I just read. We're talking about the garrison of the Philistines and it says, they went out to the pass of Michmash. I love this. If I was still having young ones, I'd think about name one of them Michmash. They'd take me out of their wheel, I know. But the word Michmash, it's a proper name. And here's what it means. They went to a place where poverty was felt. <laughs> but along with that, poverty has departed. There is a spirit of poverty that's being broken over the church. We have used false words to try to garner money. And we say what people, we think people want us to say, so they keep bringing offerings. I declare over this house that there are those sitting under the sound of my voice right now that if you listen to what the Spirit of God is saying, he is going to release an avalanche for you to be a channel through which his resources can flow. And it's not for your benefit, it's not for your glory, but it's for the advancing of the kingdom. Why? He has called you to a place of mishmash where you came from was hard, where what you've been through is tough, but he says now poverty is departing from your life and you are blessed, get this, to be a blessing. It's not just enough to have blessings in our life unless we're willing to be a blessing with what we've been blessed with. Can somebody say amen? You say, but brother Chuck, I need every dime I can get with that attitude. That dime's all you're going to get. But I'm looking for people who will let go. Poverty is not a lack of money. It's an unwillingness to let go of what we have because we're afraid if we do, we'll never get it back. God is looking for some people to be mishmash. They have felt the poverty, but they are no longer there. Why? Because it has departed from their life. And prophetic words Genuine, God-given, God-breathed, prophetic words are going to blow the chaff out of our lives. It's going to burn out the, the things that we placed on the altar. It's going to let us be the hammering effect on our culture. I'm not trying to be political, but some of you, just like me, heard the report this week of what happened in New York City with Donald Trump. I'm not, a, I'm not here promoting Donald Trump, but get this. I got a call a few days ago. My cell phone rang. Didn't recognize the number, but I'll say, I'll roll the dice and answer it. I said, hello? And they said, is this Chuck? Well, I knew it wasn't just a normal spam call because everybody on a spam call calls me Charles. That's my real name. Don't you call me Charles. <laughs> my mama used to when she was real mad. If she was really mad, she'd call me Charles Irvin because that's my middle name. But I'm Chuck. He said, is this Chuck? And I said, yes. He said, I'm so-and-so from this coalition of pastors and spiritual leaders for Donald Trump. Would you let us put your name down? I said, no. You say, are you against Donald Trump? No, but I don't know these people. I don't associate with people that I don't know who they are. Why? Because I don't want to be put in their sack. 
I want to be put where the kingdom is. How about you? And God is awakening a, a prophetic voice. Now, let me tell you right now, get ready for it because it is going to be a tale to be told here in the coming days of people saying this prophetically and that prophetically, and they're going to say this is this and this is that. But judge the prophetic word by this. Is it doing what I shared with you this morning? If it's not, put it on the back burner. I'm not calling them false prophets. I'm just saying until it proves itself, I'm not going to chew into it. How about you? I want to know what God is saying. I want to know it's from God. And I want to know the vessel carrying it is doing everything they can to stay holy before him as a blacksmith for the kingdom. I am ready for God to do something in my life. How about you? You say, but Chuck, you've got it all figured out. Please come lay hands on me if you have, because I ain't got to that place yet. We are ready to do something for the kingdom of God. Does the ark of North, Western North Carolina... You're the, I say where's North Carolina. I'm the, I'm the only, you're the only ark I know except the one up in, where is it, Kentucky? That big old boat. Don't go building no big old boat, but that's all right. It'd never float in that river anyway. Just be who God's called you to be. I believe that this house is positioned for this place. By place, I mean this region. I don't think you're here by accident. You say, well, Brother Chuck, you know, Brother Chuck, we're just another church beside the road. Shame on you for saying that. You're not just another church. You are the blood-bought remnant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid a high price for you. When you talk about that he has bought us with a price, I'm trying to quit, Pastor Mike. Uh, he has bought us with a price. That price means that you came highly. You, you cost a whole lot. You're not some Kmart blue light special. Some of you ain't old enough to remember Kmart, but you used to have blue light special. You're not a blue light special. You're not, you're not a discontinued item. You're not just something put on sale because they couldn't sell it nowhere else. You are the redeemed. You are the blood-bought church. You are the people of God. And he's raising up the spirit of blacksmith in this house so that you can do everything God's called you to do and be everything God created you to be. Somebody get on your feet and give God glory. Hallelujah. Stand up with me and worship him. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, Father. Oh, come on, worship him for a moment. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. Worthy are you, O God. Worthy over are you, O God. Oh, Father, 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 I pray over this house. Not because they are friends, but because they are kingdom. God, I thank you that you're awakening the blacksmith that you're giving fresh prophetic words, not something that's come from false lies, not something that's just come for the benefit of man, but it's come for the advancement of the kingdom. So, Father, I thank you for awakening in this house. Hallelujah. Fresh vision, yes. Fresh vision. Oh, we give you glory. We give you honor. Oh, thank you, Father. Father, I thank you that clarity comes to lives right now in this house. A new sense of clarity. A lot have thought one thing when it was really something else. And they have become so intermingled that they're having a hard time to discern what's going to happen next. I say this to you. Embrace the clarity of the Holy Spirit because he cannot lie. Clarity comes to this house. And Father, I thank you for renewed focus in this house. That people who know they're called for something more, but yet circumstances and situations has pulled them away from the thing that they are called to be and called to do. And so Father, I thank you for a fresh focus that comes zeroing in on their lives. Thank you, Father that this is not just another church by the wayside, but it is a place that you have ordained, that you have created, and now you are empowering on a whole new level to bring about your eternal purpose. Thank you for the leadership in this house, those that are and those that are yet to come because you have ordained that they be an equipping center, that they be a sculpting center, that they be a skilled craftsman, that they be the spiritual inventors for this hour so that we might see your kingdom brought forth and your power made manifest. And we give you honor. We give you praise. We glorify you in this place. For the Lord would say, I'm looking for a people who will allow me to drop the seed of my word in your heart. 
Because my word will not return void unto me, but it will accomplish those things that I've set it forth to do. So bronserebosa. So ask me, ask me, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. I know, I know the secret. I know the secret and the hidden things. So ask of me and I'll give you wisdom and knowledge concerning the next step, the word that you need for that neighbor. How do I get my loved one to you, Father God? I know, I know, I know. So I'm waiting waiting on you to ask of me. I am the Lord of the harvest and there is nothing too hard for me and I'm waiting on you because I want to do a work within you. It's through my church that I will build this house and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's through you. It's through you. It's through my wind in you. And I'm waiting for you to be like Mary and say, be it unto me according to your word. Be it unto me according to your word. If you have my word, you can run. If you have my word, you can stand against all the gossip. You can stand against all the naysayers that say it can't happen. Be it unto me according to your word. 